This week on Theater Talk. Any little horse can neigh, any little cow can moo, but I can't do anything at all but just love you. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. You did the art, didn't you? I beg your pardon? You did the art, didn't you? <laughs> I'm so terribly sorry, I didn't quite catch that. <laughs> you did the art, do you not? Do you teach art? Oh, yes, no, yes, I'm, yes. <laughs> From New York City, this is Theatre Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. There is a wonderful play at the Manhattan Theatre Club, The Pittman Painters, that tells the remarkable story of a group of English miners who become fine artists. It's a great way to start off the new theater season, and we are very happy to have with us tonight the author of the play, Lee Hall, who was on this show a year ago celebrating that minor little show you've got running around the world called Billy Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Theatre Talk. Very nice to be here. And with Lee is Decca Walmsley, I hope I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly. Perfect. Thank you. Who has been with the Pittman Painters since its inception. How many years ago up in New uh, Three years ago. I think almost to the day, isn't it? Three. Well, on Monday. We have a third birthday. Oh. Oh, that you all came together. Yeah. Well, uh, congratulations on the success of the Pittman Painters, uh, and welcome to Theatre Talk. Thanks very much. Now, Lee, just before we plunge into the Pittman Painters, I do want to point out um, Billy Elliot has now been running, what, um, over a year on Broadway? Yeah, I think it's it's yeah. getting on to, to 92 years now. And yeah. I noticed a, a million dollar a week growth, so I'm sort of curious, what does a good old hardcore lefty socialist <laughs> like you do with all that money that rolls in from Billy Elliot. Well, well of course we do the Pittman Painters. Yes, that's what we do. <laughs> you redistribute it to me. <laughs> is, that, is that true? Because this came, comes from a theater that you're, well, you're the, a big the, part the, of. The, yes, the, I guess that we've all been a part of for almost 25 years. 25 years. years. Um, mm. uh, the, the company that um, that's here at the Manhattan Theatre Club um, most of us have done at least 10 shows together yeah. over the years. And I, I knew Decca from, um, <laughs> since I was 14 and we were in the same youth theater yeah. together. So, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a family, it is. good and bad. <laughs> <laughs> what, what got you thinking about doing this play, The Pittman Painters? Well, I owed Max Roberts, who is the artistic director, a play. Um, and uh, actually, we just um, done Billy Elliot in London. and. Um, I was struggling to find anything, and I just happened to be in a bookshop one day and found this dusty old copy of uh, the book, The Pittman Painters, and I thought it was such a weird idea um, that this group of miners, who stayed miners all their work and life, mm -hmm. um, had produced this incredible body of, of work that I had not heard of, um, but that in its day was highly collectible, mm -hmm. that um, they were celebrated uh, um, you know, all, all, all over Britain, and I was just very curious. But the last thing I wanted to do was write another play about miners and <laughs> art. <laughs> I, I thought this is this is just t a terrible idea. Um, but by the time I got home in the cab and I'd, I'd read the first couple of chapters and found out this fascinating story about what interested me that they weren't just intending to paint, but they wanted to learn about art and discuss and understand art. And I so it seemed. It seemed I had to write it. And, yeah, it's it's interesting, uh, Decca, because you're you come on as one of the miners, hmm. and the miners. The play doesn't begin with the miners thinking they're going to become painters. They no. think it's an art appreciation class. It is an art appreciation class, but it's only an art appreciation class because they couldn't find any other tutor <laughs> that that week. <laughs> they want they want to do uh, economics, economics, they wanted, right? Yeah, yeah. or uh, Marxist theory, or something very overtly political. No, they have no pretensions to paint. Uh, they, they very kind of clearly say uh, what we want to do is look at a painting and know what it means. That's all we want. To, that's all we're interested in at this point. But the, I mean, the genius of what happened in life and also what Lee's done is to uh, develop that into the, the the art appreciation teacher saying, "Paint by learn by doing." Mm -hmm. You know, which wasn't a big thing then. It was all about lectures and yeah. and learn by being told. 
So once they le start to learn by doing, that's when the kind of passion for it and ability uh, is discovered and that they actually uh, learn from that and enjoy it and start to appreciate art as because they're a part of it rather than somebody telling them about it. You get a sense that these guys have so few, if you will, colors in their lives that mm. it is mining mm. all the time. Their fathers were miners, they're miners, their children will be <coughs> miners, they're in the mine all the time. Mm. There's not a lot of time for much else in their lives and this art opens up a wor new world to them. Yeah, I'm at the place that it's set called Washington, which is just outside of, of Newcastle. It's just street after street after street um, of these tiny little houses mm. that, um, and that there's kind of nothing to do there apart from work in the mine. And it's it's a sort of town that's quite far away from anywhere else. Yeah. And and literally, uh, their lives are barren. There were no libraries. There there was a club where they used to meet and drink. But these guys were uh, quite quite a lot of them were Methodists and didn't uh, drink. So there was there's kind of nothing for them to do. And they came together. And but it's a sort of there is camaraderie in the play, but there's also a great deal of argument. Mm. Um, they were they were really forceful guys yeah. um, and difficult and horrible to each other about their art. You know, it was gloves off because for them it was a, the most serious thing that they could do. This was not like a Sunday painters. This was somehow yeah. that I think it was because that at that time um, to to do this would. Uh, would be almost embarrassing in their mm. community, you know. And so they were making themselves outsiders within the community because they were doing something aesthetic, and, um, which was kind of, you know, frowned upon. Mm. So, so they did it with such passion and commitment um, and seriousness, I suppose. And the people I met who, uh, they're all dead now, but yeah. who, who knew them in real life said that they were the most serious artists they'd ever met. What the main thing to impress us? The main thing was Van Gogh. When we saw the Van Gogh art I think we became a group. Well, because we saw that art was not about the privileged. It wasn't about money. Or doing things a right way or a wrong way. Art was a gift. He did it for love. He only sold one painting in his entire life. And now they're going for thousands of pounds. Art doesn't really belong to anybody. Not to the artist. Or the owner. Or the people who look at it. Real art is something that's shared. And then um, but by the time that they, you know, they, they were retired, um, Bill Fever, who used to be the art critic for the Observer paper in um, in London, um, said that they were the most learned of all of the uh, artists that he yes, they, they ended up writing essays, some of the painters. Yeah, that yeah. They, that they're, that, that here were people who quit school at 10 and 11 to go into the mines, and this connection with art had so opened up their intellectual scope that they mm -hmm. even became able to write <clears throat> on art criticism. I mean, just on a basic level, there's something very noble about uh, a, a, about a, a, a man working for 10 hours and then not only doing that he then comes out and puts on his best suit and goes to educate himself. You think that they had these messy lives in the mines there was no running water in their houses and then they put on suits to go and pa mm. to go to the painting class. Well, you know they're very very sort of proud men yeah, uh, the, the culture was because it was so filthy yeah. and so disgusting mm -hmm. that you wanted to be exemplary when you were out of, yeah. of, of the house. But painting's very messy. I thought, how do they keep <laughs> no, to the, you know. There are photos of them with, with their jackets off. And their sleeves rolled up. And sometimes their yeah. sleeves rolled <laughs> up. They still, have the tie still on. have the tie on. They still have the tie on. <laughs> and before they would leave the hut, you know, the sleeves would come down. So yeah. they look immaculate yeah. when they leave the hut. But mm. that's kind of probably their concession to, you know, uh, to art is that they get a little bit casual once they're in there by rolling their sleeves. Y you what? cover in the play how this this work broke out and became kind of a rage in England. It was along with the uh, career of Rousseau in France, this naive, or what was called untutored art at the time, wasn't it? That, that, yeah, the yeah. They didn't take that much individual money for their paintings. They kept the work together. And they were committed to having this body of work that only profited the group. Yeah, I, I think that that's what that's another aspect that really interested me. Yeah. That, that that they decided not to go professional. Any of them, that the various ones had had, had the chance. Mm. Um, 
because they were sort of committed to this this collective ethic, and it came from the sort of politics of the mining industry at the time, mm -hmm. which was really horrible. And all the mines were owned by you know very small exploitative kind of uh, companies mm -hmm. or, um, or, or or dukes who, who on their land had discovered this stuff. And and these guys were absolutely kept to the bare minimum. It was it, and it was very dangerous. Um, and and so their commitment to each other, because literally going down on a day's shift, your life depended on your fellow mm. uh, uh, men. And I think that that's something that, that was so ingrained in their culture and their grandfather's culture that to break out of a group that you were so intimately connected with was unthinkable to them. And of course, it's more like theater. <laughs> <laughs> ah, ah. Yeah. Somebody's going to win the Tony Award and the rest are not. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, how does your theater group uh, work? I mean, is it is it based on this model of a, a collectivist kind of idea? Well, do you know, it, it sort of is. Um, the, the, it's live theater in Newcastle where the show started. It, it has a kind of a loose collection of actors who you know, you're not you're not sal you're not permanently salaried, but you always go back and work there. It's where I started my career. Lee, st Lee started right as writer in residence mm -hmm. there, um, and two or three, three or four of the actors in Pippin Painters, I've worked with many, many, many times at live theatre. And in a way, I, I, Lee, you said this to me a while ago, which was, um, it's not that different to doing what we used to do in the youth theatre when we were 15 and 16, in the way that plays were developed then. You know, the, the, somebody would come in with an idea for a play and, and you'd do improvisations and then someone would chip in with this and some chip in with that. But now Lee kind of <laughs> goes away and sculpts it and makes it the beautiful But there's an element is. of improvisation to it when you were when you were developing this play, as you're finding a character, what they might say. I wouldn't what they, say it. it's, it's, not it's, it's, it's not improv in the way that many companies work, but it's... I think that we talk a lot, and because we share our lives together, mm -hmm. um, that um, the plays develop through a lot of talk, a lot of work, and I'll take something which is very unformed in, we'll see how it works, we'll take it apart. Um, but I think that because when, I think I, I talked about it last time, uh, I was here that, that we grew up in a time in the 80s in Thatcher's Britain, um, and the youth theatres that we, that we were involved in, we didn't put on, um, you know, musicals or <laughs> kind of or plays or Shakespeare. Yeah. That somehow we we used to do. We, we did one show that we th that we took around uh, based on the miners' strike and we, that we made up ourselves. I remember you um, me. yeah. And um, and I thought that was just normal. <laughs> well, I think yeah, we all yeah. did. Interesting. And you gave up work to to do this play. I mean, over the years, there's other things that have <clears throat> drawn you away, but you I stuck know with what? the I nearly didn't do it. What? I nearly really? didn't do it. Why? Uh, well, because I was offered another job at the same time in London, and it was at a theatre that you know it was at the Royal Court, and that was a great place to work, and it could lead to lots of other work and things like that. And then this was on the table as well, and uh, I uh, I asked my agent w w what I should do, and uh, and she said do the Royal Court job because you know it, they're not brilliant parts, but it will open doors, you've never worked with those directors before, you've been to live theatre a hundred times, blah, 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 blah. And it was me, uh, my fiancé's father, when I was talking to him, and he said, don't be a fool, you know. He said, that, that play and the story of Lee's play is what you've done. It's what you're doing, yeah. And, and if, if you'd be mad not to do it. And I, immediately that, I, I stopped being so silly and told me it's not to be so silly either. And then when she came to see it, she apologized profusely. <laughs> <laughs> but when this goes to show, the enemy of collectivism is an actor's agent <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah. But we've got to wrap it up. I want to ask you, where do, wh where does this artwork now stand in the estimation of art critics today? Has it fallen out of favor a bit? Um, is it still considered important work? Um, it, it's it's in this weird weird transitional stage because I've completely fallen out of uh, anybody's notice really, mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, you know, since we did the play, the, um, the 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 work has been moved into a museum of its own, and uh, this book, which had been out of out of uh, print for for thirty years, has has now come into print. So there's a whole um, there's a whole reevaluation mm. that 
we've mm. kind of been part of, Who which is fantastic. Who owns the work it, It's owned by a trust, because they managed to keep quite a lot of it and get some of it back from um, the various people who had owned it and to, 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 to keep together. And where, where is the museum? It's in Ashington, which is just outside of Newcastle. Hmm, very good. And the site of a former uh, pit. It used yeah, to be really all gone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you can't get to Ashington, you certainly can get to the Manhattan Theatre Club to see the Pittman Painters. Very fine new play by Lee Hall. Lee, it's always a pleasure to see you. Um, got a third uh, mining mining uh, piece working on the mining trilogy. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> and Decca Walmsley, getting that right, I hope, uh, yep. who's been with this extraordinary play from the beginning. Thank you for coming on Theatre Talk. Thanks Welcome to us. Broadway. Welcome Thank to Broadway, you. yes. Thank you. Tell that to your agent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's, uh, what's this supposed to be? That's his shoulder. Looks like a horse's leg. Well, maybe he meant it to look like a horse's leg. Did you mean it to look like a horse's leg? Of course I didn't mean it to look like a horse's leg. Look, this is my first go. I can he boots, though. Oh, admittedly, the boots are very well done, but I've never seen anybody with a shoulder like that on them. Well, yes, but... I know that, I mean, but look at how well he conveys the, um... Uh, or the bulk, the sheer brute force of a miner at the coalface. That's what I'm saying. You don't send somebody big down there with a shoulder like that on them. You send down little wiry fellas like me, for instance. Please, we must be sensible. Please, help me to be sensible. We mustn't behave like this. We must forget that we've said what we've said. There is an interesting and very well-reviewed new stage adaptation of a great Noel Coward movie called Brief Encounter. It's currently running at the Roundabout. And for a discussion of the stage production and the great movie, we are very happy tonight to welcome to Theatre Talk our colleague here at CUNY Television, Jerry Carlson, who hosts the City Cinematheque show here on CUNY. He is also professor of film studies at the City College and Graduate Center. Jerry, welcome. Well, a pleasure to be back, Michael. Yes, we had you for the 39 Steps. Yeah, you seem to have gotten me into a kind of groove yeah. on this show. <laughs> you're, our, well, we're, you're our man for the expert, <laughs> you're our expert for the old movies. Um, now, this brief encounter is similar to the 39 Steps that was running for very long on Broadway, and it's a theater group that's taken the movie and they're sort of acting the movie on stage while the movie's sort of playing behind them, right? Is, is that what's going on here? Well, they've got a number of mixed theatrical cinematic effects mm -hmm. uh, in this that includes moving from a cinematic reality into a theatrical uh, reality. And that's similar to what they did in, in the 39 Steps. I have to say that these are kinds of uh, homages to the uh, or, or originals that are both try to be, uh, you know, really re respectful. There's something they, they really do respect deeply, but they're trying to reinvent it in a new theatrical language, and very, a very mixed theatrical language, not, you know, uh, not Chekhovian or Ibsen kind of realist theater, but something that um, both productions, The 39 Steps and this, you have to say it's a very carnivalesque, mm -hmm. or you could even say music hall, yep. given the British, uh, you know, context, notion of theater. We should say for people who haven't seen this type of theater, it's not just taking the movie and adapting it for the stage. Oh, ver uh, very much not. And this is, this is actually a very interesting um, uh, adaptation in the sense that this began as a stage play with Noel Coward. Right, that's right. Then it is adapted by Noel Coward and David Lean, because Lean, the director, uh, who then becomes very, very famous for Lawrence of Arabia, Bridge Over River Kwai, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. He had a very strong hand in the adaptation of the screenplay, and now it's being readapted into theater, but in a in a kind of theater very different from the little chamber piece that began with the Noel Coward. Because the Noel Coward original theater piece was a realistic, absolutely a realistic story. Much. Apparently, um, Noel Coward wanted this to be made. He wanted to help David Lean, so uh, he went and wrote a script. And he came back with a cinematic script that was really a straight adaptation of his own theater piece. And Lean said, uh, this is a bunch of people sitting in one room. Uh, <laughs> where, where, where's the, uh, the movie uh, here? Uh, and so the movie actually, you know, opens, all over the place. Op opens it up and yeah. also is a flashback movie. It's very important that the, that the movie is through the voice 
of the woman in the love affair. It's her memories. Yes. And so it's a restricted point of, it's a restricted point of view. Whereas here, uh, in this new theatrical adaptation, it's all over the place. Right. That is, it mixes, it mixes genres, it mixes voices, it mixes tones. I mean, it's, um, you know, it really reopens the piece, but, but using theatricality. What, what is Noel Coward getting at? In this, in this play, in this movie? Well, uh, it, it's v very interesting that uh, Lean, who is originally, he was really probably known for his big movies, yeah. Lawrence of Arabia and this, he wanted to do a big movie. He'd had, he'd been working with Noel Coward on three films together and he wanted to make the leap. And Noel Coward said to him, don't do that. You don't know anything about costumes. Now, Lean is very young. Can you imagine yeah, saying to David what, Lean, don't know anything about costumes? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. This is like this, 45, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. A passage to India is a, lo is a long yeah, right. way in the future. Right, right, right. Okay, almost, almost right. So, he, uh, Coward said, you should do something about things you know about. And I think you know about the middle class British suburban life. And I have a play I wrote about that. And so I think that this is a perfect match for that. And uh, Coward's sort of up to the notion that there are, in the international reputation of the British, there are actually deep emotional waters beneath the British calm. Yeah. Uh, and between the, 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 what Lean himself thought was the damning boredom of the British suburbs that he'd grown up in. I mean, Lean himself became a filmmaker because he wanted to get out of his middle class house and as a child kept going to the movies to get out of the suburbs. But Coward knew where there are human beings, absolutely. there's drama. Ab absolutely, absolutely the case. And you don't need, and the drama is in the ability to evoke a sequence of emotions, not in externalized action. Right. And, you know, uh, Lean found ways to capture that. On and film. we should just say for people who haven't seen the, the movie that it's about um, uh, a man and a woman, both of whom are married and they begin an affair. Uh, right. Absolutely. But, and it is a chance. It's a chance encounter in a, in, in in a, a train, train station. In, in a train station. Uh, and it's about uh, more than being a carnal story. Yes. Uh, it's a story about how they connect with a set of emotions that they had thought had forever been lost to them, that this incredibly strong sense of, you, you have to say it with the capital R, romantic attraction. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, not, it's not a little R, it's a capital R because it really is a film that owes a great deal to the, the British romantic sensibi sensibility. One of the things that I've always loved about this movie is that you have this juxtaposition of these very deep romantic emotional feelings with a very drab setting absolutely of the train station of their middle class houses of the little provincial town that they're in and that always seems to me really to give the, the, a lot of attention to them and yet shot so beautifully absolutely now it's interesting that this film which is now considered a, a you know a meta classic yeah. within the british cinema and a classic wherever it's shown won an award at the Cannes film festival uh it was received well by the critics but it was not a breakout uh box office success really? in, in 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 britain uh because and lean actually wrote an article about this uh about the time and he said i think we may be a little bit ahead of our audience and he said that's troublesome because we would like to be matched with our audience but this has the these people were not stars uh the drab setting yes. the fact that there's little physical um action and that ultimately the couple does not end happily one of the things that makes the film interesting uh because uh, lean before he became a director was an editor mm -hmm. so he knew how to manage faces when he was assembling uh, a scene. It's a film that uses reaction shots. Mm -hmm. So while people are talking, mm -hmm. the tendency is to go away to the face that's receiving the words and to, and to encourage us as spectators to read their psychology. What, what is she thinking and feeling as he's saying these words to her? Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, you know, hats off to Trevor Howard and Celia Johnson because they give these great cinematic performances that the, that the, the close-ups really read complexity with without you know very significant theatrical gesturing but just yeah. the way they're looking the the twitch of an eye the the move slight movement of a lip all of incredibly that incredibly subtle acting incredibly subtle acting in that movie absolutely Barry Day who's the uh, editor of the Noel Coward letters told me that Celia Johnson you know she has that that great face where she just seems to be kind of in her own world 
And apparently Celia Johnson was completely myopic and couldn't see anything without her glasses. So that look was just her, my, her myopia. <laughs> but who knows? Well, if it works, it works, Michael. <laughs> yeah, and I would only say the stage, ad I agree with you, the stage adaptation is a carnival and it's fun, but what it can't capture, because it is a carnival and a stage ad adaptation, is the real subtlety of the movie and those performances. I, the way I would say it is that the, you know the film is like a beautiful Mozart string quartet, and and the uh, stage production is like a boisterous overture by Rossini, and those are <laughs> right. very very different things. <laughs> very good. Well, we've been discussing Brief Encounter, that great Noel Coward David Lean movie that has been adapted for the stage at the Roundabout. Thank you very much, Jerry Carlson, the uh, host of of uh, City Cinema Tech here on CUNY Television. It's always a pleasure to see you. Always a pleasure to be here. Thanks to Thank both you. of you. Thank bye you. bye. Next Thursday. Yes. Thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.